Good morning, First Presbyterian Church. Um, it is it's really good uh, to be here. Uh, if I have not had a chance to meet you yet, my name is Joey Sherrod, and I was privileged to have two seasons here at this church. First, uh, as a child uh, of this church, uh, and then as an associate pastor here. Um, and early, we're here, my family and I are in town uh, this weekend, and yesterday I had a chance uh, just go for a run uh, downtown onto campus uh, where I used to do be a part of college ministry uh, and then just to come up here and as I was doing that just reflecting on these two seasons that uh, I have had with you guys um, particularly on the time I had here uh, as a pastor I was just reflecting about how little I knew when I was called here in 2007 I mean I don't think I could have found my way out of a pulpit with a map um, and uh, you all, uh, those of you who I was able to know, uh, just so kindly and patiently uh, suffered under my ministry here. Uh, and I, we are just so grateful. I mean, to, uh, just to, to paraphrase Paul in, in Philippians, uh, every time I think of you, I thank God. Um, so it's really an honor to be here. I'm just so thankful for the Lord's faithfulness to me through you and his continued faithfulness to you through Martin and through Dean and through those who continue uh, to serve here. We're going to be in Judges chapter 17 this morning, so open a Bible and keep it open even after we read because uh, we're going to be referencing the text um, throughout the sermon. Um, I know you switched to 10.30 a.m., but we still get out at 2, right? Isn't that correct? <laughs> just want to make sure about that. Um, Judges 17, uh, the whole chapter, uh, it's like the seventh book in the Bible, so it's near the front. This is Judges chapter 17. Let's listen to the word of the Lord. There was a man of the hill country of Ephraim whose name was Micah, and he said to his mother, the 1,100 pieces of silver that were taken from you, uh, about which you uttered a curse and also spoke it in my ears, Behold, the silver is with me. I took it. And his mother said, Blessed be my son by the Lord. And he restored the 1,100 pieces of silver to his mother. And his mother said, I dedicate the silver to the Lord from my hand for my son, to make a carved image and a metal image. Now, therefore, I will restore it to you. So when he restored the money to his mother, his mother took 200 pieces of silver and gave it to the silversmith who made it into a carved image and a metal image. And it was in the house of Micah, and the man Micah had a shrine, and he made an ephod and household gods and ordained one of his sons who became his priest. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Now there was a young man of Bethlehem in Judah, of the family of Judah, who was a Levite, and he sojourned there. And the man departed from the town of Bethlehem in Judah to sojourn where he could find a place. And as he journeyed, he came to the hill country of Ephraim, to the house of Micah. And Micah said to him, where do you come from? And he said, I am a Levite of Bethlehem in Judah, and I am going to sojourn where I may find a place. And Micah said to him, Stay with me, and be to me a father and a priest, and I will give you ten pieces of silver a year, and a suit of clothes, and your living. And the Levite went in, and the Levite was content to dwell with the man, and the young man became to him like one of his sons. And Micah ordained the Levite, and the young man became his priest, and was in the house of Micah. Then Micah said, now I know that the Lord will prosper me, because I have a Levite as priest. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Father, even as we just sang, Lord, that's our prayer. Now, Lord, we would have Jesus. We would see Jesus as we come to your word, Lord, and so we pray. Be faithful to your covenant promises to us, Lord. Show us him, the living center of this text. Show us ourselves truthfully. 
Show us his abundant grace to us, Lord. Lead us into life. And so we ask you to do that, to you, for you to be the one who speaks. Address us with your grace. We pray all of this in Jesus' strong name, who lives and dwells with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. All right, Judges 17. You heard it. Let's just sort of go out and name the elephant in the room about this story. It's pretty boring, all right? I mean, this is one of the most boring stories in the entire Bible. And if you think about the options I had to preach from, even from the book of Judges, it could have gotten a little spicier here this morning, right? I mean, the book of Judges has weird vows that cause people there to lose their daughters' lives. It has fleeces that magically have water on them. It's got jawbones. It's got fatal haircuts. And then this, Judges 17. But I would just say that I have a very distinct memory of a sermon I heard preached on this particular text. Uh, on a long car ride one summer during college. You don't remember every single sermon that you've ever heard, but this is a sermon that I would say changed my life. Uh, and it was a sermon that was preached by Tim Keller, and I'll just acknowledge that a lot of what you're going to hear uh, this morning I owe to him. But let's see what the Lord has to say to us from Judges 17. There are four things that we can find in this passage. We find small people, we find small gods, we see big problems, and then we see a way out. So we'll look at each of those in turn. Small people, small gods, big problems, and the way out. We'll look at each of those in turn. First, small people. In Judges 17, we meet three small, boring people who do trivial, small things. Micah, Micah's mother, and the Levite. They are not particularly bad people, particularly when you think about the judges as a book and the options that we have there. They're not particularly good either. They're just kind of small, right? All throughout Judges, we've been seeing these people who sort of drive the narrative with who they are, people like Gideon or Samson. And the narrative in Judges usually follows one of those people. But we get here, and there's really not that kind of thing. We see three people, not particularly exciting, not really a protagonist or a hero. Three people doing pretty insignificant things. There's Micah. When we first meet Micah, we find that he has stolen some money. In fact, he stole the money from his mom, right? Which is a pretty petty and small thing to do. And then he overhears her cursing the person who did this. And he gets a little scared. And so he says, hey, mom, it was actually me. I was the one who stole the 1,100 pieces of silver, and he gives it all back to her. And then mom's, Micah's mom responds by saying, Blessed be my son to the Lord. A reaction that, I mean, given the fact that Micah just stole her entire life savings is a little odd, you have to admit, right? And she makes a pledge, a promise. She says, once the 1,100 pieces of silver are returned to her, I dedicate this silver to the Lord. Except, not really, right? Because how many pieces of silver did she give to the silversmith? Not a rhetorical question. How many did she give? 200, right? And in fact, what she does as a way of dedicating silver to the Lord, as a way of honoring God, is just break the second commandment, right? Which you have to admit is an interesting way to honor someone, right? To break and disobey something that they told you explicitly to do. And if you're actually paying attention, you look through these first 13 verses in chapter 17, about half of the Ten Commandments are broken in just that amount of time. And so Micah and his mom, they set up their own shrine, an alternative to where God has said that he must be worshipped, at the tabernacle, which is in Shiloh at this point in the Old Testament. And as... Micah's thinking to himself about how all this is going to work. He says, you know what? I'm going to need a priest. 
And so first Micah makes his son the priest. But then a Levite comes into town. But he really, if you were paying attention, notice he just kind of wanders into town, right? In the same way that Micah and his mother sort of have this lukewarm character to who they are, the, the Levite is the same way. He's just sort of wandering around. We don't know why he's in Ephraim. doesn't really seem like he really knows why he's there, too. And so Micah sees this and sees a way to upgrade his priest situation, right? And so he tells the Levite, come and be the priest at my house. And it's a pretty good deal. I mean, you have to admit, the only thing that the Levite has to do is to violate pretty much everything he's ever been told about how to worship God, right? So he's going to worship an idol. He's going to worship away from the tabernacle. He's going to make his own ephod, etc., etc., etc. And so he signs up to be Micah's personal priest. And Micah kicks his son to the curb, which, again, you just have to say it's kind of petty that he does that, right? And at the end of the passage... Micah, self-satisfied, says this. He says, now I know that the Lord will bless me because I have a Levite as a priest. Small people. Small people who live small lives full of small things. They're not really that bad compared to other things that happen in the book of Judges. But by no stretch of the imagination are these people good or heroes. These are people who measure out their lives in teaspoons, who fill their hours with trivial things, people who spend most of their time focused on themselves, people who for some reason or another have actually just been hollowed out on the inside. In other words, these are the kind of people who, when I lay my head on the pillow at night, I'm afraid I'm like. When my own life is measured out, how small will it be? And I just wonder if I'm alone in feeling that. If I could just ask you a question this morning, let me ask you, do you sometimes worry that your life is small? Do you sometimes worry in a world that is full of such big things, of beauty, of goodness, of evil, of suffering, a world where men and women are capable of incredible acts of kindness and love, a world in which our neighbors go through difficult periods of suffering and sadness, do you sometimes feel like you're kind of on the outside of all of that, on the periphery of all of that? That maybe, maybe there's something more, right? Maybe there's something more and just binging the latest Netflix series, or catching up with the latest dumpster fire on social media, or chasing down the latest celebrity gossip, or living for the next vacation, or rising and falling on the prosperity of the local team, or whatever it is. Maybe at some point you come across somebody who's just different, right? I mean, when you're around that person, it's like you've been in a stuffy room for more than you can imagine. And then in that person's presence, it's like someone opens up a window and a cool breeze comes in. Because there's just something different about that person. They're passionate. They, their life isn't small. They are somehow different, big, full, in a way that you and I aren't. And you feel small in the presence of that person, of their joy, of their passion, of their fullness of life. And maybe you wonder, as I sometimes wonder, how did I get here? What am I missing out on? Well, Judges 17 tells us exactly how we got there. That brings us to our second point. It 
small gods. We see it in verses 3 and 4 of this passage. Micah's mother has a silversmith carve a statue, an idol, an image of God. It's an idol. Now, there's an explicit command from God not to do this. It's the second commandment, which we talked about earlier in our service in our confession of faith from the Westminster Catechism. We might ask the question of our Lord, what's the big deal, God, right? I mean, why is this a problem? I mean, surely this could be a compliment to God, an act of worship to take a significant amount of money. I mean, 200 pieces of silver, it's not 1,100, but it's still a lot of money. To do this in honor of God, to set it apart, to make something in God's image, to praise him, to worship him. Why is this something that God is against? Why does he care about it? Well, here's why. A carved image shrinks God. It takes the infinite God, the God of holiness, power, of glory, of majesty, and it shrinks him. It takes the God who is perfectly holy and perfectly loving, the God who is fully just and full of mercy, the God who is exalted over us, And yet he was also nearer to us than we are to ourselves. It takes him and it shrinks him. The reason God does not want us to make images of him is because when we make an image of him, we will necessarily lose a part of who he is in his majesty. We will overemphasize one part of who he is over and against another, his justice over his love or his mercy over his holiness, we will begin to forget that this is the God of the universe we're talking about here, who existed before time began and who made everything. The reason God says, don't make an image of me is because he actually wants us to know him. And he knows that if we make something in his image, we will miss out on some part of who he is. If we try to capture the infinite God into some finite piece of metal or whatever it is, we will end up with something other than the real God. We'll end up with a God who we can take, we can just put in our pocket, carry him with us, ask him to do whatever it is that we need of him, a God we think that we can control, a God we think we can manipulate, a God of whom we can just say, just like Micah does here in the end of this passage, now I know that the Lord will prosper. That's why the second commandment is here. It's so that we don't shrink God, make him in our own image. And it's also there for you and for me, whether or not we try to build out our apartment garage into a personal shrine or not. This is for us, right? We can still have a small God. And when we worship a small God, we become small people. There's this chilling verse in Psalm 115. It's talking about idols. And just like Micah and his mom make an idol, it talks about what happens to people who make idols or who trust on them. And this is what it says. It says, those who make them become idols like them. So do all who trust in them. What does it mean to become like an idol? It means to become small. If you worship a God who is mute and lifeless, then you'll become mute and lifeless yourself. And that's actually the lie to all of sin, to all of idolatry. Right? I mean, the promise that sin makes to you and to me is look how much better things will be, right? I mean, look how attractive it will be. But sin doesn't make you interesting. It makes you small. It makes you boring. The people who have given themselves most over to idolatry, 
are not the kind of like evil genius masterminds that you see in the movies, right? People who give themselves over to idolatry are boring. They have become what they have given their life to. If you have a small God, you will become a small person. That's the promise that Scripture makes to you and to me. And to illustrate that, we're actually going to move on to our third point this morning, which is big problems. Big problems. In 1961, the philosopher Hannah Arendt, she traveled to Jerusalem to witness the the trial of Adolf Eichmann, who was one of the main architects of the final solution. And she was covering the trial for the New Yorker magazine. At the end of the trial, she wrote an essay on what it is that she had witnessed. You see, Hannah Arendt came in expecting something of Eichmann, but she left completely surprised by what it is that she had encountered. She thought Eichmann, responsible for the death of millions of Jewish men and women, that he would be this kind of sinister monster that you might expect, you know, kind of person who makes your skin crawl, who's devious, who's intelligent, who's a mastermind, some larger-than-life villain, like the Joker, you know, for example. But what she discovered was that he was a different kind of evil than the one that she expected. Eichmann was boring. He spoke in cliches. He was poorly educated. He was unintelligent. He lied about his accomplishments, bragged about things that he actually hadn't done, couldn't think straight, couldn't follow an argument to its conclusion. And afterwards, Arendt wrote an essay. It's called The Banality of Evil. And banal is just another word for boring. The boringness of evil. Adolf Eichmann, Nazi mastermind, the man who ran the gas chambers, managed the concentration camps, was boring. What Hannah Arendt discovered was that evil so often happens through boring and small that's exactly what the book of Judges tells us, right? I mean, Judges 17, this boring, small story about three small people, this is the beginning of one of the most harrowing and horrific chapters in Israel's history. I mean, when we move on to Judges 18 to 21, the kind of things happen that we would really need to dismiss most people under age 17 to talk about, right? There's assault. There is murder. Someone is actually cut up into 12 pieces and mailed to the 12 tribes of Israel. And if you're reading along, you're kind of wondering to yourself, where did all this come from? I mean, we went from these three boring things that happened here in Judges 17, and then all of a sudden, boom, horror. But what Judges 17 actually tells you and me is that this isn't coming from nowhere. The direct result of small people who worship small gods is big problems. Big, big problems. And it actually isn't that difficult to figure out why that's the case, right? Small people are easily manipulated. Small people chained to their desires and whatever it is that they want to do. They can't submit what they want to be true to what is actually true. Small people can't imagine what it would be like to be in somebody else's shoes because they're too busy focusing on themselves. Small people are much more likely to turn their head away from suffering and evil if it might inconvenience them and ask them to rearrange their own small lives and small kingdoms. People who worship small gods are much less likely to be concerned about violating the image of God and someone else. And on and on and on. And Israel, by the time Judges 17 gets around, it is a nation of boring and small people. And what happens next is chaos. 
assault, murder, civil war. And this could play out on the grandest of scales, or it could play out in a family, or in a workplace, or anywhere else. If you create a small God who is primarily interested in you, you will get evil. There is no way around it. If your God is primarily interested in your personal freedom, then you will leave others out to suffer in the cold, to be tread on under your own feet so that you can get what it is that you want. If you create a God who is primarily interested in giving you approval, you will lie and slander on others to get what it is that you think that you need. If you create a God who's primarily interested in giving you security, then there is no standard of righteousness that you will not break so that you can keep yourself safe. Small gods lead to big problems. Amen, right? Let's end the sermon here on that good news, right? No, last point. What you and I need is a way out, right? It's what we long for. I've already asked you one question. Can I ask you one more this morning? Do you want to live a big life? Do you want to live a life that is full of meaning, full of joy, a life that is big? Well, what you will need is a big God. Because if your God is big, then you can be big. If your God is a God who is overflowing with life and joy, then you will overflow with life and joy. If your God is a God who is infinite in love and mercy, then you will have love and mercy as well. If your God is sovereign over anything that this world can throw you, then you will be able to handle anything this world throws you. You need a big God. And that's what Israel is longing for here in Judges 17. That's why verse 6 is right where it is. In those days, there was no king in Israel, and everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Israel needed a king, and that is exactly what you and I need as well. We need a king. And here is why we need a king. Three points of application, and then I'm done. First, we need a king who is big enough for when we don't understand. A king who's big enough for when we don't understand. Recently, in the last few years, NASA put a new telescope into space. It was replacing the old Hubble telescope. It's called the Webb telescope. When they first started taking these pictures, what it is that they saw, they were publishing the pictures. You might have seen some of them. There's this one picture uh, of like a field of stars, and it's this wide-angle picture of the heavens. But actually, they're not stars, they're galaxies. Now, we live sort of surrounding one sun, it's called a solar system, right? Solar system, a few planets orbiting one star. Now, each picture, each like picture in each dot in that picture that you see, it's not a picture of a solar system. It's a picture of a galaxy. Now, each galaxy has in it around 200 to 400 billion solar systems, right? That is how big this universe is. And we are just one speck on one planet in one galaxy in one solar system. And we have a God who is big enough to hold all of that, all of that in his hands. There is not a molecule in this universe that God does not have control over, does not understand where it is and what it is doing at any given time. And friends, sometimes there are things that happen in our lives that we just don't understand. I know you know this as well as I do. But when we don't understand, we need a God who is big enough that he understands and that when our life is out of our hands, it is still in his. We need a God who is big enough for when we don't understand. 
Second, we need a king who is big enough for our hearts. King who is big enough for our hearts. Small people have small hearts, right? But Christian life is not a life for people who have small hearts. It's a life for people who have big hearts. When we look at the expression of perfect humanity in the person of Jesus, the perfect man, we see a man who in the face of evil and injustice is angered. Who binds up a cord and drives it out from his father's house. We see a God who in the face of suffering weeps and is saddened. And we have... Our Lord Jesus has given us a book of prayers for you and for me to pray. We don't know how to pray. And that book is a book for people with big hearts, right? There are things in the Psalms that I would blush to pray in Christian worship. Lord, where are you? Why have you forsaken? Lord, how long? Lord, will you avenge my enemies? And that is how he teaches us to pray as well. Because the God of the Psalms is a big God. Big enough to handle whatever it is that our hearts would give him. When our hearts are big, when they are overflowing with things that we can't control, you know what the Lord says to you and to me? He says, bring it here. I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid at all. We need a God who is a God of big hearts. And then second, we need a God who is big enough for when you and I need courage. For when we need courage. Some of us have big things in front of us, conflicts that we know will take a lot out of us to negotiate, decisions where we feel like we don't know the way forward, confessions of things that we have done that we need to tell another about, troubles where we feel underwater. And we need a God who is big enough to help us in those things, and actually more to help us, to steer us and to guide us. The God who in the face of these things, when you and I say, I am not enough, I do not have control of the situation, who says, I am enough. I do have control of this for anything. A God who parts seas, who stills storms, who raises people from the dead. It's the kind of God that you and I need. And that is the God who is promised to you and to me in the gospel. That is the God who, when we see the face of Jesus, is the God whom we see, a God who is with us, who has said to you and to me, I am with you. I will never leave you or forsake you. We hope you enjoyed this sermon from First Presbyterian Church in Starkville, Mississippi. If you want to find out more about our church and our ministries, please visit fpcstarkville.org. If you'd like someone to reach out to you and uh, maybe grab coffee or lunch to get to know us a little bit better, you can go to fpcstarkville.org slash connect and fill out the form there. And if you like what you're doing and want to see more, uh, go to fpcstarkville.org slash give to give.